I'm John DeVore. Welcome to the DeVore Fidelity YouTube channel. Today's video is going to be a bit of a rant, <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> I want to talk about one of my main pet peeves about the hi-fi industry. And it's one that actually dates back longest for me. It dates back to the mid-90s. And it is one of the main reasons why I started DeVore Fidelity as a speaker company. Why I became a professional from being just a, a hobbyist and an amateur speaker builder. And it has to do with the speaker sensitivity specification. The speaker sensitivity spec for loudspeakers has traditionally been expressed in a simple sentence. Some number of dB per watt per meter. So let's break that down. The, the number of dB, let's just use it as an example, 88 dB for one watt at one meter. This means that that speaker, speaker A, will play at 88 dB loudness with one watt of power going into it measured from one meter away. It's a very simple specification. It's very clear, it's very intuitive. Uh, it makes sense. Wattage is the way that we measure power. Wattage is also the specification that we describe amplifiers as having. So we know amplifier A is going to have 25 watts, amplifier B is going to have 35 watts, and these wattage numbers are going to directly relate to that speaker sensitivity number. We know that a speaker with a lower sensitivity number, let's say a speaker with 84 dB per one watt per meter, is going to require more power than a speaker that has, say, 94 dB at one watt at one meter. So what does this have to do with anything? Sometime in the mid-90s, that specification changed. And I have a theory as to why that is. There was a pretty dramatic trend all through the 80s and 90s uh, in high-end audio of speakers becoming less and less efficient. They were becoming harder and harder to drive. And it was essentially an extension of the trend started in the mid-50s when Vilcher and Kloss founded Acoustic Research and essentially came up with the idea of an acoustic suspension speaker, which roughly is a speaker that could be much, much smaller with the similar bass response as a much larger speaker by sacrificing sensitivity. So if you drove it with more power, you could have a really tiny package with, with fantastic bass response. You, didn't, you no longer needed a really big bass reflex or horn-loaded uh, colossal system, which was the typical system of the late 40s or 50s. Um, and that trend went all the way through, uh, including the 60s and 70s, the 70s with the receiver wars, with companies like Yamaha and Sansui and Kenwood making these monstrous battleship receivers with more and more features, but importantly, more and more power with bigger and bigger power supplies, just these giant tanks of receivers. And so that trend of more easily accessible power, certainly more easily accessible than back in the day when you had to have tube amplifiers, uh, and harder to drive speakers continued all the way through the 80s and the 90s and, and even after that. Uh, but I really became, I, I started to pay a lot more attention to it in the 90s. I'd been an audiophile for many, many years before then, but in the 90s, um, I just, I got more interested in the interactions of speakers and amplifiers and how it related to those similar interactions from decades past. And one thing I noticed when really kind of looking into this was that specification of dB per watt per meter changed. And it became dB per 2.83 volts per meter. So how can one just take out one watt and replace it with 2.83 volts? Well, the speaker company said, well, we can do it because it, it's equivalent. It's the same thing. Well, it, is it? It is the equivalent in only one very specific situation. 
So if we look at Watt's law, Watt's law describes power as watts. So Watt's law is wattage equals voltage times current. So we see that the wattage is dependent on two variables, voltage and current. There are a lot of values of voltage and current that could equal out to be one watt. So how do we come up with what makes that equivalent? Well, we need to add Ohm's law to that. And Ohm's law is one that brings the loudspeaker's impedance load into, the, into this equation, into this mix of numbers. Ohm's law describes the value of voltage as the current times the resistance in ohms. And the resistance is the impedance of the speaker load in this case. So does that now allow us to make an equivalent? Yes, it does. So if you combine Ohm's law and Watt's law, you can express it as power equals voltage times voltage divided by resistance. Or you could also describe it as power equals current times current times resistance. So now you see that you've got this inverse relationship between the voltage and the current in regards to the wattage. You increase the current, you have to decrease the voltage to, to keep to that same uh, one watt value. So for one watt to be equal to 2.83 volts, you need to have a speaker impedance, R, resistance, of 8 ohms. That solves out to essentially one watt. And that is why these speaker companies are calling this equivalent. Why would they change it? Well, along with making their speakers less and less sensitive, they also made them have lower and lower impedances. When speaker sensitivity was measured in dB per one watt per one meter, it didn't matter what the impedance of the speaker was. A great many speakers back in the dawn of hi-fi, you know, let's say the 30s or, or so, or even 40s, uh, they could be 24 ohms or 16 ohms was very popular. A lot of Western electric drivers were in the, in the you know, 24 or 16 ohms. Um, 8 ohm became sort of the industry hi-fi standard, so to speak, in the 60s and sort of continued on in that vein and 8 ohms was kind of like the expected impedance load. But through the 80s and certainly into the 90s, impedances started to drop considerably, uh, along with the sensitivity spec in that watt per meter phrasing. One of the things that was happening along this time is that because speakers were becoming so much more difficult to drive, high-end audio amplifiers, Krell, Threshold, Mark Levinson, they started making these brutish solid state amps that would double in power with every halving of impedance. So a 100 watt per channel Krell amplifier would be a 200 watt per channel Krell amplifier and into a 4 ohm speaker. And it would become a 400 watt per channel Krell amplifier into a 2 ohm speaker. Of course it would become a 50 watt per channel Krell amplifier into a 16 ohm speaker. And that's Ohm's law dictating that relationship there. So again, why did the speaker companies decide to change this specification? Well, let's look at a state-of-the-art high-end audio speaker from 1990. It's from Teal Audio, which unfortunately is a company that no longer exists, but in the 80s and 90s, it was absolutely in its heyday. Uh, it was considered a real uh, innovator. Jim Teal was a great speaker designer. Uh, and had some great ideas and built some really classic speakers. In 1990, his flagship speaker was unveiled and it was the CS5. And it was this huge all-out assault on state-of-the-art. Uh, Stereophile magazine reviewed it in 1991 or 1992 and generally raved about it, but it measured it and it was clear that it was a brutal speaker for an amplifier to drive. The, the entire bass range, um, everything below the mid-range was essentially a 2 ohm load uh, and in parts dropped considerably below 2 ohms, one and a half, one and, one and three quarter ohms. So in the specifications sidebar, John Atkinson, who did all those measurements, 
put in a note. So the teal specification in that sidebar said 87 dB per 2.83 volts per one meter, to which John Atkinson added in parentheses equivalent to 82 dB per watt per meter. 82 dB per watt per meter is really low. That's an embarrassingly low sensitivity spec. That's down there with legendary speakers like Apogee and stuff like, I mean, the Apogee Duetta 2 from that same time was 80 dB. So what these speaker companies were essentially mandating was that you used these giant power doubling amplifiers like the legendary Krells. And in fact, I think even to this day, John Atkinson uses a classic Krell KSA 50 amplifier in all of his speaker measuring uh, sidebars. I'm sure specifically for that reason. He knows that it will double its power into uh, having speaker impedance loads and that will allow him to make these voltage-based uh, sensitivity measurements. The problem with this is that the vast majority of amplifiers do not behave like these classic Krells. Uh, digital switching amplifiers absolutely do not behave like this. No tube amplifiers behave like this. I mean, a 100 watt per channel tube amplifier, let's say with the, with the classic output transformer secondaries, it'll have a 4 ohm secondary, it'll have an 8 ohm, and it'll have a 16 ohm secondary tap. It's going to be 100 watts per channel at 8 ohms, and it's going to be 100 watts per channel at 16 ohms and at 4 ohms. It's the same. It's going to be 100 watts into those loads, and as you deviate from the center of those taps, 4 ohms, 8 ohms, or 16 ohms, you're actually going to lose power. So if you're connected to the 8 ohm load, and you have 2 ohm load in the base of your speakers, you're going to have way less power going to the base of your speakers than you are going to have going into the treble or the mid-range of those speakers. And it's going to completely mess up the way those speakers sound. So it has essentially made the sensitivity spec meaningless for most people. Uh, and it's the, it's the sensitivity spec that, that continues to this day. So that all of these sensitivity specs that are published in the reviews like Stereophile.com can be misleading at best and outright false uh, at worst, uh, you know, somebody who's who wants a single-ended triode amplifier, that voltage sensitivity spec is useless. <laughs> uh, in fact, it can be very misleading and can lead to some very bad uh, amplifier speaker interactions. So that's my rant. It is absolutely one of the main reasons I started the company, and most of the speakers since then have been legitimately 8 ohm speakers. And so, in a sense, that one, uh, that one watt versus 2.83 volt similarity actually does work. But if you look at our orangutan series, those are significantly higher impedance than 8 ohms. And so that 2.8 voltage spec starts to become meaningless because you're actually measuring their sensitivity with way less than one watt, for example. And so that's the story of my main pet peeve in the high-end audio industry. Uh, I hope you enjoyed me venting a little bit, and um, thanks for watching, and I'll see you at the next video. Bye.